So, once again, but that, that's quite short. I think we should get through it in, in under half an hour. So, basically, um, the objective for the brain parcellation have not been edited. They are the same as the functional connectivity mapping. Oh my God, I finished the slideshow very late. My apologies for that. Uh, the objective here is to know which are the main resting state networks and what are techniques uh, that are being used to extract them. And I'm also going to try to cover on um, somewhat, not open question, but definitely technical challenges that you may have when, when you run a brain parcellation yourself uh, and things you, you need to consider. So why parcellation, first off? Well, parcellations are used as a tool to build connectomes. So a connectome, typically, you're going to look at every region in the brain, and um, you're going to compute measures of connectivity between every pair of those regions. Maybe you're going to threshold that, maybe not. But at the end of the day, you're going to have a, a, a graph, nodes and edges. And clearly, the parcels you use are going to change a lot the way your network looks. So here you've got some networks, or actually those are average connectivity patterns, the ADHD 200 samples that we released uh, like almost a decade ago uh, with a few folks. And uh, the, the paper is, is, is still quite recent, but it's because I was very lazy and slow writing it. Um, so it, we, we released publicly some pre-processed data for a competition, and we also released a bunch of connectomes. And uh, here you've got some kind of like connectome build from the average of the whole sample. And uh, on the top left, you have a very popular um, uh, structural parcellation. So uh, regions that have been drawn based on where they are in the brain, and it's called the AAL. Um, uh, you've got a couple of functional parcellation as well. Here you've got the CC parcellation with 200 regions or 400 regions. So CC stands for Cameron Craddock. It's, it's made by Cameron Craddock. At the name indicates at the bottom, you have this like region growing algorithm I developed during my PhD, uh, which um, uh, and I'm quoting the recent survey by Arslan, where Belek was the worst. So I, I don't think it's like the best parcellation out there, but it's a parcellation. And um, one of the cool things of the algorithm is that it, uh, it, uh, it scales well. So you, you can uh, add lots of parcels and um, uh, cover up for the shortcomings of the parcellation algorithm by just having lots of details in, in, your, in your network, just by the sheer number of parcels you use. So uh, interestingly, like lots of people use the, the, the parcel at the, at the top coming from the neuroimaging uh, community. And people who come more from like machine learning and statistical background, the papers typically use the one at the bottom. <laughs> I think they like the challenge of the high resolution. But what's striking is that those networks, at least like visually, uh, you, you, you can see, uh, first of all, that the overall structure seems to kind of be different. I mean, it's a 2D embedding, obviously it's limited, but uh, but also that you have a tremendous amount of details when you scale up the number of, of, uh, of regions that start popping out. So uh, uh, right away, you can see that parcellations matter and that resolution, the number of, 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 uh, of uh, regions you have in your parcellation matters a lot. It's going to impact a lot for your overall summary. Now, does it matter a lot for your end product and statistical analysis? It's a slightly different question. But in terms of the, of the degree of details you're capturing, definitely it does. So reducing dimensions is one uh, reason why you want to parcelate. Um, I, 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 maybe I should have listed another reason. Maybe also those parcels, some people, uh, they, they think it can inform us about how the brain is organized. You know, back to this very last slide uh, I, I showed earlier. Uh, so there's uh, people who are actually obsessed about parcelating the brain to try to understand its, its organization principle. And it dates back to like a uh, German uh, neuroscientist. And there's a, a long and strong history of German neuroscientists wanting to parcelate the brain and, and, and understand how it works uh, through that. Um, uh, I, I'm going to actually uh, take this opportunity to just um, uh, mentioned the, the passing away of Carl Zillas, who was one of those uh, giants in the field and, and, and one of the leading figures in that school uh, uh, approach. Um, 
uh, we're probably going to celebrate his, his, his achievements and, and life career during the Human Brand Mapping uh, Conference. So there's uh, people who like, feel really strongly about our solutions out there. And they're not just a way to reduce dimensionality. It's a way to, to tell us a story about the brain. All right. So this graph I, I briefly mentioned how it's built here. I've got a, a figure to sort of like first explain a little bit uh, more and uh, also make a connection with what I just showed you in terms of uh, functional connectivity and seed-based connectivity. So on the left, what you have is one of those uh, 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 par parcellation at, at the bottom, so the one where you have a, a lot, and um, they're specially connected in that case. So that means that you know, a voxel within a region, they touch each other in, in 3D, and you have about 1,200 of them. And so for each region, you're going to compute an average activity and you're going to compute a, a, a correlation score, just like we did before, between the time courses of every pair of regions. So what you're going to have is a, is a matrix, a correlation matrix. And people may, may, may talk about a correlation matrixomics uh, if they were honest, but instead they, they speak about functional connectomics, but those are the exact same thing. Functional connectome is nothing more, uh, at least in the majority of cases, than a, a, a correlation matrix for time series. So what you, you have is, uh, you know, here 1200 by 1200, each row, each column is a, a region. And so at the intersection of a row and a, a column, what you have is a score between minus one and one, which is a correlation of their time courses. Here I only represent positive correlation because there's mostly positive correlation in your data if you use at least a minimal preprocessing. So, if you look at the co column of that matrix, what you have is a particular region and its connectivity with all of the other regions in the brain. So what you have is really a, a, a seed-based connectivity map where the seed is that particular region. It's shown the right, actually, I've chosen that seed so that it is the posterior cingulate cortex, that key node of the default mode network. So the map you've got here is a default mode network um, map. Uh, except it looks like kind of pixelated and it's a little bit, so it's called a compressed map because you compress your voxel-based map in the space, the embedding space of this parcellation. And that's the terminology you, 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 you see uh, more and more those days, uh, Gael Varroco's group um, and uh, Bertrand Thiron's group in uh, Parietal Lab uh, uh, in France uh, use that terminology a lot. And uh, I mean, that's, that's what they are. They're, uh, uh, a reduced representation of seed-based connectivity where you do every voxel against every voxel. And some people want actually to go every voxel to every voxel, but I think it's a little bit of an overkill because there's so much uh, spatial structure in your data that uh, it's, you, you get really accurate summaries even with, uh, with a thousand parcels. And bear in mind that, you know, modern uh, resolution, you can have up to a million voxel and a, a matrix that's a million times a million is, is big. It's really big. Uh, it's uh, how much is it? It's a million uh, gigapixel if, if you think about units from the from, from uh, digital picture. So even for modern standards, that's still like a pretty big matrix to put in, in, in the memory of your computer. So most studies do parcellation and work with this kind of connectome. Actually, a lot work more in the 200, 300 red rather than the 1,000 red. So something that's striking in that matrix, if you order the region well, is that you get the squares on the diagonal. So what does that mean? That means that all the regions that are in, the, in this range, for example, they have high correlation uh, among themselves. And if you look at correlation with, with regions that are outside of that group, they're mostly low. I mean, you, you do have interaction with other types of networks, but so here you, you've got one of the squares on the diagonal. The, the matrix has been ordered uh, in a smart way. So you can see those, those squares. Uh, the squares are highly dependent on, on the order in the matrix. But that particular square happens to be the default one network. And it's mapped beauty, beautifully here. So what that means is that all the regions of the formal network tend to mostly correlate with each other and have, um, relatively speaking, lower connectivity with regions outside of the default mode network. 
Now you can also see that I could zoom in this DMM network and see like smaller squares and subnetwork. So you can already guess just by looking at this matrix that um, you can find big networks through parcellation, but you can find subnetworks and sub subnetworks, and actually you can go down all the level to uh, re regional, especially uh, specialized uh, areas. Uh, all re with the structure of the functional connector. And so that's what parcellation means. I, I use the term parcellation in a very sort of loose way, where parcels can be either connected in space, like what I presented on the left, or they can be kind of like distributed in the brain uh, and they're more like network. So at least it's not a well accepted terminology in the field, but generally when I talk about region, what I mean is that they're spatially connected. When I talk about network, I mean that they're spatially distributed. And when I talk about a parcel, I mean either of those things. Uh, so how do you get a parcellation? Well, there's a whole family of technique I'm not going to be talking about, which is actually uh, probably the best technique, which is like a decomposition-based uh, technique, such as uh, independent component analysis or uh, uh, sparse dictionary learning. But I'm going to be talking about cluster analysis because I, I think it's uh, the one that's conceptually easier to understand. And it actually can um, uh, identify those uh, networks uh, very well. So uh, I, I decided to focus on that class of technique for, for, the, for this little uh, mini lecture. So what is cluster analysis? Well, you talked about it during week one. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sort of recap quickly for you. Uh, with a, maybe a slightly different angle than what you've, you've, you've seen in week one. Because, you know, in, in functional connectomics, this connector matrix plays a big role. And I find it's useful to understand cluster analysis through the lens of a connector. So what you have on the left are points. They live on two, in two, two dimensions. They just lie on my screen. Some of them are closer to each other than others. I have roughly two clouds, the blue cloud and the red cloud. Um, they are, those points are actually a 2D embedding of a high dimensional data set that I simulated. And on the right, what you have is a correlation of the time series that were simulated and that those points try to approximate. And what you see in that matrix, in that sort of like functional connector matrix, they are square on the diagonal. And those squares are your clusters. There, the, you know, the, the blue dots and the red dots. So you can see that all the points in that section of the matrix have highly similar time series. So there are the blue dots. And all the points in that section of the matrix have a highly similar time series, and they actually happen to be the red dots. And if you look at time series from blue dots and red dots, they, they have low correlations with each other. And if you want to sort of identify this structure in a data-driven way, what you can do is use old and trusty hierarchical agglomerative clustering um, and look for the sort of pair of points that have the most correlated time series and merge them. And so now there's a little cluster. You started your process here. So I guess here you, you've got what's called a dendrogram. Dendros is a Greek word that stands for tree. So it's a, a, a tree schematic. And it shows you the aggregation of objects uh, over a, 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 an iterative process. It's a very old idea, really. Like I, I believe uh, Pla Plateau was already using this type of, of decomposition uh, a couple of thousand years ago. So you, you've got the, the merging going on here. When you've merged two elements, well, you can merge them further. All you need to do is define a new metric, like how similar is a particular point with a group of points. So there's different rules. There's uh, the mean uh, similarities, the max similarities, the average similarities, there's a word similarity, which has this very beautiful analogy with physics and uh, the uh, Horgan's principle in physics. So, you, you do that and you keep going and, 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 and the more you merge, the bigger your cluster become up until at the end, you've merged everybody with everybody. And so whenever you decide to stop, it gives you the number of cluster you get. 
So here is I stop right before I've merged everybody with everybody. I got actually two clusters, which are the blue and the red dots, and it worked. So why not everybody's using cluster technique from the 70s? I myself wonder about that. Uh, K-means, which is another classical one, and hierarchical clustering actually, I believe, can provide state-of-the-art results in fMRI data. Um, they are definitely uh, are not uh, uh, state-of-the-art techniques in general, but the structure in fMRI is pretty strong, and you do not need, I think, very fancy technique to re uh, recover those structures. Um, I think there is a love of researcher for developing new things, but that if you use uh, uh, old algorithm and you apply them really well, you can push them to, to high performance even in 2020. Um, maybe not straight out of the box, but close enough. Um, so a, 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 a big uh, thing in cluster analysis for brain data is to have a, a spatially constrained cluster. Because if, if you do, like what I explained to you, work with the connectome. So if you want to do it at the voxel level, it's going to be uh, intractable. Uh, the matrix is going to be too big. So you're going to see a lot of people that actually start by regions that have been defined one way or another and, and, and do clustering uh, based on that. So there's a, a lot of papers those days using the Louvain algorithm, which is one of the more recent techniques, so supposedly better. Um, for some reason, because it's not been evaluated really. Um, and uh, they, they, they take a parcellation from the web and then they apply the Louvain algorithm at the regional level. So that's what you have at the bottom here. And then at the top, you would have algorithm that start directly from the voxel. And to do that, instead of, of trying to merge everybody with everybody, you only merge special neighbors. So instead of having, I don't know, 50,000 voxels to compare with 50,000 voxels, you have 50,000 voxels to compare with, say, eight, nine, a number of, of special neighbors, depending on how you differ special neighborhood in, in 3D. There's different conventions for that. So those are ideas that were really explored in the early 2000s, including by yours truly. Um, and uh, that, that's a way to do voxel-based cluster analysis without blowing up your memory. So there's many papers that use either or approaches. And sometimes some, some papers actually mix, it, mix the two. Uh, my actually first paper in my life uh, uh, was mixing those, those two things. Um, so uh, in terms of the main networks that I've reported in the literature, interestingly, I would say the main landmark paper is the Yeo Krinan paper from 2011. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's actually, in many ways, it's, it's far from being the first doing uh, a connectivity cluster analysis. But I would say that the reason why that paper is a landmark paper is how good it is. It's absolutely amazing. First, it's, a, it's a massive. Um, uh, it, they looked extensively at everything in their data. And also, it, used a, it was one of the first papers to come out with a, a thousand subject uh, to generate the parcellation, which gave a lot of credibility. People felt like, oh, that's going to be very robust. And also their parcels were very nice. And they sort of recapitulated the most robust features that people have noticed in their data in the past decade. So that paper uh, got a huge attention. And uh, uh, it's sometimes called the Yeo paper. But I, I would bring uh, just as a side note that this is a shared first tutor paper and uh, Krinan, she, she's also a first tutor on that paper. So I tend to always talk about the Yeo Krinan parcellation rather than just the Yeo parcellation. So um, uh, that's it. So what are those uh, different networks? Well, we actually talked about some of them already. We, you've got the somatosensory uh, network there, which is easily identified by seed in the, in the primary sensory motor cortex. So here in the center, you have your parcels. And on top, you have a seed-based map with a well-chosen seed. And that seed is here, the, the Bisval 95 seed. And sure enough, uh, at least when you average any subject, you're going to get a very clean sensory motor map. Um, you've got the default mode network, obviously. It's, uh, it's here. Uh, we don't have its medial view. And I'd say that the, the more like iconic uh, visualization of the, of the default mode network is more its, its medial 
uh, representation, but uh, you, you've got a, a, a lateral one. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to to, to get off uh, for just a second to reduce the noise level in my in my immediate surroundings. I'm sorry about that. So, uh, the other network we did not talk about is a visual network, but that's actually probably the most robust one uh, you, can, you can identify. And then we're entering the mess. And the mess is um, uh, the, the realm of frontal par parietal networks. And in that realm, there is, in the, in the, in the, um, uh, Yeo terminology is two. There's the dorsal attentional and the frontal parietal. Um, I mean, frontal parietal, the dorsal attentional is frontal parietal. So they're both frontal parietal. So what he calls the frontal parietal here, or maybe what I call frontal parietal here when I, I read that slide, is um, yeah, I'm just checking whether I messed up his own terminology. I believe, yeah, no, orange is frontal parietal. So that's straight from the paper. Um, maybe it's kind of like ventral dorsal, it, but there's also the salience network and the singular opercular network, so, which are terms you're gonna hear. And I would say that there's this beautiful paper that came out, uh, Lucina Udin is the first author uh, like the, earlier this year, where she's trying to find a common terminology to call these networks. Like, I think there's a kind of like more singular percular network. It's, it's not e easy to, to, to uh, breaking down in a, in a very consistent fashion on one end. And then you, you have uh, attentional networks on the other end, which have a, a ventral and, uh, and the dorsal part. Uh, and you also sometimes hear about the executive control network. And all those things are kind of overlap. And in truth, they are not robust at the individual level, definitely not. Um, uh, we, we've got a recent work with a PhD student, um, uh, uh, Amal Boubdir, where we, we, we kind of showed that they actually reconfigure a lot uh, dynamically over time at the individual level. And that if you look at that dynamics of parcellation, you, you can get very clean network at the individual level. But if you if you try to parcellate the brain and have one parcellation that's static, um, it's going to be a little bit valuable, the results you, you've got. And those networks may break down one way or another, depending on essentially luck. So that's that. Now, uh, it, it says seven clusters of uh, Yeo, Crinan, uh, and you only have six. Uh, it's because there's the, um, the, the, the um, cursed networks, the one that didn't make it to the figure, um, and uh, that is the mesolimbic network. So it includes um, temporal uh, pulse and uh, orbitofrontal cortex. You can see it actually here a little bit in cream, the limbic network. It's actually robust. Uh, it's uh, actually a fascinating network. Uh, in our earlier work uh, with Christophe Grova, we, we, we looked at that in temporal lobe epilepsy, where it, that network's actually uh, modulated strongly. But um, it has a, a sort of like uh, a bad reputation, or people have. Uh, so somehow I never had the chance to ask uh, the authors of that paper why they didn't uh, highlight it in their figure. But I have my own paper where I have my own seven cluster uh, decomposition actually earlier than this one. And uh, I also took it out of the figure. <laughs> and I know why I did it, at least I can tell you, is because those regions are highly, highly noisy in fMRI. So there's all kinds of uh, defor deformations that happen. And the first time I saw, saw those networks, I, I was a little bit scared and I thought maybe they're just noise artifactual network. And that's what I, I said so in the paper. Since then, I've realized that they, they are not. Um, we have done a number of experiments in my lab, and I think, I mean, yeah, they, they're modulated by disease and things like that, which are not consistent with the idea of pure artifacts. So there are probably regions that are of slightly lower quality, but I, I believe this is a very legit resting state network, the, the mesolimbic one. 
So anyway, those are the main networks. Um, uh, they also tried to uh, do a little bit of a higher uh, level decomposition, and I already motivated that when I told you, you, you know, it's a matrix, you can see the DMN, but you can break it down further. You can actually break it down further a lot, like hundreds of functional parcels. But they tried a 17 cluster solution. And um, one of the things that they noticed is how uh, the, the visual uh, network beautifully breaks down. And uh, a lot of the paper, actually, the reason why it's like 70 pages long or something like that is because as they go and they discuss every one of those decomposition and essentially conclude that it fits with some basic aspect of the, of the visual uh, network that we know. Some of which I, I believe most, all of you are going to be familiar, such that, you know, the V1, V2, V3, V5, and uh, inferior temporal areas. So that's kind of like the, the, the hierarchy of, of, of propagation in the, in the visual cortex is driving some of this. But there's also this notion of extrinx, extrinx, oh God. I, I don't even know if I can pronounce it in English. I'm really sorry. Um, extrinsicity, um, which is you know, where you lie in the, in the visual field, whether it was more central or more peripheral. And that also maps uh, in a, in a gradient-like fashion in the, in the brain. And uh, some of those uh, parcellations are likely driven by whether you're more central or peripheral in the, in the visual field. So I'm uh, absolutely not a visual science uh, researcher, so I, I won't be able to, to expand on that. But um, what's clear is that those my finer scale parcellations, they follow some uh, really well-established and uh, uh, consensual aspects of brain organization, such as somatotopic organization is another one. There are several papers showing that in the somatosensory uh, network, when you break things down like that, it kind of, of follows what we, what we know. Now, I, I wanted to, to throw also in a, a little slide to say you, you can also merge those networks. Uh, and actually, the most stable decomposition resting state network is two networks. And it's been reported, as far as I know, for the first time by Paulina Golan. Uh, she's uh, actually a, a, a computer scientist at MIT. And uh, she had this paper on, on cluster analysis. She actually worked with Yeo, uh, Yeo used the technique developed by her lab. And um, yeah, you have those regions. And essentially, the, you've got this, this green network that kind of at first feels like a DMN. And then you know whatever is not in there. But really, um, what you have is a merge of all those frontal parietal networks and the DMN in one big entity. And all like sensory motor, visual, auditory cortices uh, in another entity. And so the way that was uh, interpreted is a more exogenous versus endogenous networks. So networks that are one which is mostly driven by this extrinsic activity based on whatever the world is sending. Uh, and networks which are more mostly driven by the intrinsic activity. So, you know, I insisted earlier on this distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic activity. And really, one way of interpreting these results is that we, we do have a more intrinsic network and a more extrinsic network in, in the brain as well. Um, that also maps to some degree with my, my, my alienation of, of cortex. Um, this here. So a big question, like a challenge, if you do cluster analysis yourself, that's going to be what is the number of clusters? When I explain hierarchical clustering, clearly you can have as many clusters as you want, anywhere from the number of, of, of regions of voxels you have in your brain to one big cluster. And that solution is very stable, but it's not that interesting because basically it's a mask for the analysis. Um, so what is the number of clusters? I've wasted my use trying to, 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 to respond to that question. I would urge you not to work on it. I think it's a complete waste of time. Um, it's whatever is the answer. There's different level of details you can use to describe your data. And whatever makes you feel good and makes your algorithm feel good is good. So there are lots of paper looking at metrics to choose the best number of clusters and I've committed some of them. But 
I don't think they're robust. And even they are, that doesn't mean that because a technique can reliably tell you seven, that seven is anything special. Um, nine may be not as good for that particular metric, but that doesn't mean that nine doesn't capture interesting things in your data. So here you've got a, a connectome. You've got big squares that show you the main networks. And if you look at this, like, I don't even know what that color is. I guess it's somewhere between the green and the yellow. Uh, so uh, absent, maybe? <laughs> if you look at the absent uh, square, um, you, you get a sensory motor network. And, and if you keep going, it's going to break down into this nice, like, ventral dorsal um, uh, gradient, which does map with what we know of the um, uh, somatotopic organization. In the middle, you have the hand areas so that uh, are, have been used by the Peace Val uh, paper. But you can uh, keep going and decompose it into further sub areas. And that looks like that. And I believe the type of decomposition you have uh, still has some, some, some meaning from a, a physiological, sort of biological perspective. So Sebastian Erx, uh, who's a TA in the, in the, in the lab, as a, in the uh, TA for the, for, the, for the course, an instructor for the course, he's also uh, published that paper recently. And that particular atlas is in Nyler. Um, and uh, he's also painstakingly uh, labeled all those regions. And uh, I believe uh, one of these days is going to take the time to make a pull request to Nyler. So you can also have the labels for your analysis if you want to use that, that atlas. But if you want to try many scales, it, you, you, can, you can try that. that. Uh, there's also the Schaffer Atlas, which is very popular, uh, which is from the Yale group. And um, it's, a, it's a great atlas. Um, the, the labels are a little bit more arbitrary. Um, but I would say, it's, uh, first of all, it's a surface based atlas. It's, um, the validation was really extensive. And I would say, at, at the moment, it, it is the most popular multi resolution atlas out there. So that's another one to consider for uh, multi resolution atlases. Now, an important question that people ask themselves when they do parcellations, like how homogeneous are our parcels? So basically what you have on the top left here, that's a, a figure drawn by the Cameron Products 2012 paper, where he introduced his uh, spectral cluster um, technique. Um, so, so on the top left, what you have is a voxel-based, um, seed-based connectivity map. So you put a seed in the PCC and you get the default mode network. It never gets old. And uh, what you have in the other uh, viewers, uh, they're um, uh, compressed maps. So I already explained with the connectome what a compressed map is. It's essentially, you know, you approximate that seed-based connectivity map, but the averaging signals on, on, uh, on uh, parcels, and more generally by projecting your signals into a new basis, which would work whether those basis is, uh, is parcels. Um, uh, from clustering or from ICA or from whatever as PCA, whatever. And what you can see is that they resemble each other. It's wonderful. Um, so the compression kind of works. But depending on the atlas you, you do, um, that compression may be more or less successful. So Talarak and Tuonu sucks. Um, sorry, Talarak and Tuonu. Um, you're just not good for uh, functional uh, compression. But um, if you look even at random parcels with 200 parcels, they kind of work. So you've got a lot of papers that are going to try to, to kind of uh, play this sort of uh, uh, arm uh, race. Uh, or maybe I'll get the expression wrong here. But they try to compare algorithm on the basis of how homogeneous they are. And I also have a maybe not completely consensual, but very strong opinion on this. And you should not care about this. So here's a graph from Sebastian's paper that shows the homogeneity of the parcellation. Uh, I actually have used uh, the wrong version of the graph because they, they end the labels on there and they end the random parcels on there. So Sebastian has uh, since improved that graphic. But you're going to have to trust me on this one. Those, those uh, little cycles are different types of parcellation. So you've got the Eocrinan 7, you've got the Eocrinan 17 in there, you've got the AL Atlas, you've got the Brain Netum Atlas, you've got the Gordon Atlas, you've got the Glasser Atlas, very good Atlas, the Glasser Atlas. Everybody, it's very impressive Atlas. They all behave exactly the same. Like if you do a linear regression, you can predict their homogeneity very, very precisely just by how big the parcels are. 
So slightly depressing for those of us who try to push the boundaries of uh, methods in brain parcellation. In terms of homogeneity, if you want to gain, all you have to do is throw in a little bit more parcels. And interestingly, random parcellations, such as the one developed by Cameron, um, match or even exceed slightly the homogeneity of some of the state of the art parcellation, including the Oreo one. So that's something you've seen papers, that's something that's discussed, and I think that's something that, like, what drives the homogeneity of group level static parcels is the size of the parcels. It's, I'm not that cynical. I actually believe you can get really good parcellation, but I now I'm fairly convinced that uh, good parcellation will necessarily be um, uh, dynamic and individualized to some degree. And I have to throw in a big caveat here. I'm going to reference a bit of the work, but um, uh, the, the parietal group in, in France has been pushing those uh, uh, sparse deterring learning basis function. And I believe those give you much better compression of your data than, than uh, cluster-based parcellation. So, you know, in, in terms of, of homogeneity, the parcellation doesn't really matter as much as the size of the parcel. But if you switch the type of basis function you use and, uh, and you use more like smoother and, and correlated uh, parcels, uh, then you can compress your data much more efficiently. Uh, that's available. The, the paper is, uh, the, the, the keyword is DIFUMO, D-I-F-U-M-O. Um, that is the first author. Uh, I think this is a, a, a better alternative uh, for, for compression. So then there's a question of how stable the parcels are. It's a very busy slide and I'm, I'm being very slow here. So I think I'm going to not comment on that a lot, but uh, I think the take home message here is that on the left, you have group level parcels. And if you have enough subjects, they're going to be highly reproducible. In the middle, you have an uh, average of individual level parcels and the stability is uh, much lower because there's a quite a bit of inter-individual variations in parcellation distribution. And on the right, you have individual level uh, stability metrics. And some of them are really stable, like the visual one, but some of them are also very unstable. And currently, I'm, I'm now convinced that uh, the, the source of this lack of um, stability is not necessarily how much data you have per subject, but that uh, there is dynamic reconfiguration and that you, you really need to, to look at uh, uh, families of parcellation that capture different sorts, uh, rather than try to find a single uh, individual parcellation. Um, once again, there's like a preprint I can link on this, so it's of interest. Um, so now, what is a good parcellation? Because I just <laughs> really uh, sort of uh, mostly put holes in, in a bus like parcellations that uh, claim to be better either because of their resolution or because of their homogeneity. Uh, there's this uh, a beautiful survey that came up a, a couple of years back that uh, Aslan put together. He tried to compare things across a number of metrics and, and his main conclusion that there, it kind of depends. It wasn't like a clear winner. As I said, I think in terms of homogeneity, really it's, it's a pointless exercise. Instead of stability, I also think really, you know, what matters is more like the level of analysis and group or individual and so on, rather than uh, your algorithm. Um, some other metrics that have been looked at the literature quite a bit, so or what they agree with their task activation maps or overlap with CITO architecture. And they, as I mentioned that briefly, but some people I'm going to name, like Simon Eckhoff, for example, um, uh, really believes that functional parcels should ultimately align with cytoarchitecture cyto uh, and uh, think that should be a validation uh, measure for, for, for parcellation. So you're, you're going to see those kind of metrics in the, in, the, in the literature. I don't think that those type of evaluation actually bring an answer. Uh, you know, it's, it, at the end of the day, they're like, oh, well, it depends. And um, recently, there's been this uh, paper 
And once again, I need to up, uh, update those slides. I apologize, I didn't have time to up, up, update those slides uh, since, uh, two years ago. But uh, that, that was a PNI paper by Kalamaka Daddy. Uh, I've, I've actually mentioned that work several times uh, in, in my talk, but now I finally get a figure on him. And he's doing an extensive uh, benchmarking, looking uh, uh, at uh, different prediction tasks and how much the parcellation matters. And so what you have here is for different, like the ADNI data set with uh, 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 Alzheimer's, dementia, COBRI data set with schizophrenia, a CPI data set, which I don't know what, uh, how, how well um, uh, you can predict those things, those levels, and how, how, how much of a, 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 the parcellation impact your results. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, the structural atlases kind of don't perform very well, like the L, Harvard, Oxford atlas is not great. Kamins and Ward are those algorithms from the 70s I mentioned, and they, they don't do well. Out of the box, they don't do well. I think with little effort, you can actually get them to state of the art. But, um, but I, 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 this is kind of more for um, maybe a publication in a, in a couple of years. So I'm not going to expand too much on that. But uh, if you look at uh, the Basque algorithm, which is the one Sebastian used, uh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, if you look at the group ICL dictionary technique, uh, they're also uh, in the same range. Uh, actually, I believe the, the winner here is dictionary learning, but by a very small margin. So, uh, that's another way to benchmark a, a, a parcellation. I think this approach is beautiful. This paper is very thorough. Uh, I, I, as I said, I don't, here again, I don't think there's a clear winner. It looks like a lot of functionally driven parcellation seem to, to be doing fairly well. At the bottom, actually, you, uh, you, you have other types of, of decisions. So I've only talked about simple correlation but they also looked at other uh, more advanced type of, of connectivity uh, metrics and found them to be uh, slightly beneficial. So there's a, a recent, so that was a, a short paper, but it just published a, a, a masterpiece of a paper, which is a diffumo paper I was talking about uh, earlier. And uh, so I would encourage you, if that's a topic of interest for you, I would encourage you to, to, to read that uh, reference because you know, if I had to pick one recent, that are the most uh, the best done and, and uh, the most comprehensive. Um, now, other important question, how do you go from group to individual parcels? So uh, I mentioned quickly, yeah, there's a lot of inter-individual variability that was beautifully demonstrated recently um, by uh, Nico Dozenbach's group uh, using the, the Midnight Scan uh, Club data set in which uh, subject were scanned for, uh, if I recall correctly, 10 hours, no, five hours, five hours. Um, and um, I always make that mistake somehow, I think it's 10 hours, so it's five. But anyway, we, with that amount of data, they were able to derive some quite stable individual level parcellation just through uh, massive averaging. Uh, and uh, what, they, what they noticed is that there are some kind of like idiosyncratic organization, uh, subject by subject, which are highlighted here in, uh, in uh, black, I believe, for the salience network, uh, which is there. The, the purple being the singular opercular network, and I think they're kind of the same thing, really, but whatever. Uh, they are valuable across subjects, and I, I believe like this is a uh, uh, a very uh, clear point. So, you know, how do you deal with that? And so you still have like a bunch of paper coming out trying to deal with that, different approaches. And I don't have a strong opinion, but I think that's actually something important. Like if you just use group uh, level parcel, you're gonna, the compression of your subject is going to be suboptimal and you may actually introduce a bias where systematically maybe your patient population is much uh, less well compressed than your, your uh, population of interest. So you'll find differences, but they will be artifact of the compression. So here I'm citing like, it's a figure that's from a, a, a paper by Liu six years ago, sort of like trying to put a little bit of the landscape of how you deal with uh, individualizing parcellation. 
there's different approaches. Uh, some where you proceed individually and then you sort of group, and uh, then maybe you're going to try to and, and you stop there, uh, or you're going to try to to bring back your group atlases and somewhat project them in the individual space. So the original uh, group ICM method by Vince Callum's group, which is very very influential, uh, proceed that way. And then you have a bunch of more recent iteration where they try to somewhat loop between the individual decomposition, the group decomposition. So, you know, using the group as a prior and then refining the individual network and then going back. Yo's group has a beautiful work along that line where the, the group and uh, individual parcellations are, are all uh, estimated jointly. I don't have a strong opinion on this. Um, my personal guess is that you can actually you don't need to go prior and that if you properly capture dynamic, you can get extremely reproducible, high quality individual parcel. Probably you have a, a lot of data at the individual level. But uh, the, the, you, you're going to see, so there's a thing called the dry regression ICA. that is one solution to that problem that's very popular. There's a the back propagation back projection techniques that's used in the GIF toolbox by Vince Calhoun. It's also a, a, a quite popular one. But so there's a pint technique developed by Aaron Dickey in Toronto, which is very promising. Um, so that, that's it. There's a, a zoo out there of, uh, of, of, of techniques like that. And I also wanted to, to finish by just emphasizing, I, I took the sort of like choice to talk about parcellation mostly through clustering because I feel like the clustering is the easiest to understand what it does. But there's people who feel strongly that uh, you should have instead of, of, of uh, sort of like fixed parcellation where a region is in the parcel or is not in the parcel, we should allow parcels to be um, uh, distributed and, and be more like radians. So you, you would be in a parcel to some degree and I think there's a lot of, of sense to this. Like the borders between cytoarchitectonic uh, areas, they're, they're not uh, sharp, or at least some of them are not sharp. They're more gradual. Um, there's a host of techniques you can do with that, but the simplest one would be to take the connectome and run it to a PCA. And here you go, you get gradients. And actually, I mean, the, the gradient analysis are resurging as something very fashionable and very new. But actually, uh, uh, some of them are just running a PCA. So in, in a way, it's a comeback of like a <laughs> technique that had its, its peak 20 years old. 20 years ago, it's get, getting back into fashion. But uh, it looks like actually the gradient that are extracted uh, are very meaningful and uh, recapitulate some of these organizational principle with this uh, more endogenous versus uh, uh, extragenous. Um, uh, activity. So uh, Daniel Margulies had a landmark paper four years ago on this um, and uh, the, the figures are beautiful, they're very convincing and it shows that just, just using a few gradients you can really, uh, it can really help you understand how the different networks are uh, functionally organized and um, uh, there is a special relationship with, with one another so if you're intrigued by that uh, direction of research, you, you, can, you can look at, uh, at that. And there's a, a toolbox, Python toolbox, uh, Brain Space. So it's developed by uh, Boris Bernard's group uh, here in Montreal to implement that. So that's all I got for parcellation. I don't think we'll have time for pre-processing. And uh, in any case, it's probably better you watch uh, um, Basil's talk for this and follow up with Basil. So it works out for the best if we went with the parcellation.